Hi there, my name is Arjen Times and I'll be presenting what's coming to Jakarta Faces today. So, who am I? I'm a 40 years Dutch developer from the Amsterdam region and I obtained a Master of Science degree in Computer Science from the University of Leiden, the Netherlands. On the picture you see me at one of the canals with a typical Dutch bike, the true pride of our country. So, what did I do that's relevant to this presentation? I was previously a, a GSF, a GSF 372EG member. I'm the uh, product lead for the respective Jakarta projects, including Jakarta Faces, API, and Eclipse Mara. And I'm the co creator of the OmniFaces uh, library. It was a 2015 Duke's Choice Award winner. And um, OmniFaces has been quite influential to Faces itself. I'm also the author of two books uh, The Definite Guide to JSF in Java EE8 and ProCDI2 in Java EE8, which will be released soon. Okay, so the agenda for today is as follows. We'll first be looking at whether faces is still relevant, as this is a question that comes up quite often. After which we'll take a look at an exciting new runtime to run faces on. We'll thereafter clarify some of the first year madness that has been going on with Mara recently. Finally, we're going to take a look at what's coming in the next version of Jakarta Faces. Okay, so to start with, the big question that might be in everybody's mind, is Faces still relevant or not? So Faces, called JSF back then, but this is a term we can't longer use, uh, was introduced in 2003, by coincidence almost together with Spring, I think even in the same month. And it's gone strong for over 16 years now, which is quite a bit longer than many other frameworks. So in the beginning, uh, Faces 1.x focused uh, primarily on things like navigation rules, post packs, and all component pages. And this kind of abstracted it from HTML. So the, the idea was to be a bit swing-like, um, or a bit like the later Fadin. Um, and at some point, this was okay. But then later on, it wasn't so okay anymore, as people were more wanting to use HTML and HTTP directly. So Faces 2 introduced in 2009 uh, massively responded to that. Uh, it effectively was a major paradigm change. So all those things I mentioned above were de-emphasized, like uh, navigation rules uh, mostly. And in its place came um, first class support for regular get-based links. So you could do that before. You could just use an HTML link on a page, but it wasn't um, it wasn't supported that well, so you couldn't attach uh, validators to it. Uh, it was a bit more difficult to pass in parameters and what have you. So with Faces 2, uh, Faces got first-class support for that. Uh, same holds for the post redirect get pattern, which is when you do post back to a page, and then after the page action has been uh, done, you redirect to another page, or maybe even the same page, using get, which means that if you um, go back to that page using your browser's uh, navigation controls, you wouldn't um, repost that page again. So this is a clean way to, uh, to do post. And uh, JSF got first class support for this as well, um, mainly by using a parameter for a navigation outcome. Um, so the, um, the pages, the views in JSF, also called the templates, um, at some point in time, we thought that they, it was the best practice to make them all component-based. Um, the idea being a little that you could render them in different technologies, so see HTML or uh, XAL, what have you. Um, but then at some point, it became clear that like really HTML was the only target. Uh, so it wasn't needed anymore to satisfy best practice that um, pages were entirely built out of components. And this means that the emphasis in phases two became more on pages that were HTML first and only used some components here and there uh, were needed. So there was a lot of critique on uh, JSF, especially with the one that X version. There were quite a number of issues with them, uh, many basically uh, resulting from JSF using uh, JSP so that single decision not to go with its own templating language from the beginning, but use, uh, reuse uh, JSP had a major impact on everything that followed. Um, JSP by itself is a really fine technology, 
but a few templates for uh, JSX was like really problematic. There were syncing issues, uh, content was uh, not aligned, the entire uh, facing didn't quite work. Uh, so um, JSF has to process in phases, but um, when you run executed JSP page, it writes directly to the output, which is not suited uh, for JSF. But despite all those issues, um, JSF has, of the basis, I have to say, um, has always been among the top tiers in um, in most things like surveys, um, number of questions on Stack Overflow, a number of books written about it. So we're going to take a little look at um, some surveys here. So on your screen here, we see a, a survey from Jax Enter. So this was in 2004, and it showed uh, JSF um, faces on the number two position. And that's quite good. Uh, play the Spring MVC, for instance, were quite a bit lower here. Of course, it differs per, per survey. So in one survey, uh, JSF might be number three, and Spring MVC would be number one. In another survey, JSF could be a three, and uh, Fadin could be number four, and say, um, what have you, GWT would be number one. So it, it did to differ a little. But the the main thing the the surface had in common, that the JSF was like always in the top uh, tier, so always at number one, two, or three, approximately. Okay, so this is a more recent survey. This is from uh, Java Magazine and the um, Snake or Snake, whatever you call it. And here you see that uh, JSF, as it was still called in the survey, had 90%, uh, meaning it was uh, placed on number three, which is still quite good, which is still in the top tier. So it's going down. Um, so you don't quite see this in this surface, it's still like in the top tier. But overall, JSF usage is going down, but it's still, still quite good. It's still in the top three here. Okay, so what's the reason that JSF went down a little? Um, so, so it might not come as a surprise to many that um, the rise of client-side frameworks contributed quite a lot to this. It essentially started in 2010 with AngularJS. Um, AngularJS was actually in its, uh, the way it felt, the way it felt to develop in it, um, it did quite feel like, like JSF at the time. So it was quite inspired seemingly by, uh, by JSF. Then in 2013, we saw a React by Facebook being introduced. In 2014, a Vue, and in 2016, Angular. It, despite its name, is quite a different framework from AngularJS. And uh, what we see in the graph is, of course, quite clear. Uh, there's a very big rise in uh, popularity of this. Um, so in this graph, um, Angular is the blue one, and React is the red one. So they're both rising quite rapidly, uh, React even more so than Angular. And this has quite, this has had a quite um, profound impact on uh, server-side frameworks like JSF. So it's not just the JSF that went down, um, other server-side frameworks went down as well. So in general, I think it's fair to say that client-side frameworks are clearly the more popular choice today. It's always hard to, uh, to estimate exactly or to uh, have the exact numbers of usage, but conservative estimates would put uh, client-side frameworks about eight to ten times uh, being more popular than things like Faces, things like JSF. Um, but that's okay. It's um, especially in the Jakarta ecosystem, um, they're quite compatible with Jakarta EE. So Jakarta EE offers, besides uh, Faces, um, facilities for uh, RESTful uh, web services, so Jakarta REST, or specifically uh, Jakarta Servlet can provide the data that uh, client-side frameworks need to, uh, to operate on, and they do this quite well. So you could use uh, CDI beans for business logic, uh, persist your data using Jakarta Persistence, uh, put uh, validation constraints on them using um, beam validation, so that's all quite, um, quite productive to use. Um, so, at the whole, we see that uh, Jakarta Faces is down, but it's definitely not out. 
if you look at some of the actual numbers for Jakarta Faces, it's it's quite interesting to learn that Prime Faces got about a million downloads in 2018. Prime Faces is a component library for Faces, so this of course means that every Prime Faces application is also a Faces application. And a million downloads really isn't that bad, I guess. Okay, so if you look at some of the other numbers, we see that OmniFaces got approximately a quarter of a million downloads last year. And furthermore, we see that some 27,000 projects on GitHub depend on Prime Faces, while for OmniFaces, that's almost 4,000. Uh, the Eclipse implementation of Faces, Mahara, currently gets about uh, 7,500 views every month, which is not as much as it once was, but it's also not crazy bad, really. Quite importantly, uh, Faces is also still supported by some key people in the Jakarta EE community. So for instance, Mark Struberg recently said that uh, JSF2 is just so damn productive, which is quite good, I guess. And specifically, he says here that JSF is still uh, rocking big time, and especially when it comes to EC development of data-driven UIs. And that's indeed the uh, market that JSF is aiming for. So another way to measure whether a given product still has relevance is to see if there's an active ecosystem around it. And for Faces, this seems to be quite okay. Um, in the last month alone, we saw releases of uh, Boots Faces, releases of a new project called Prime Faces Achillean. And despite the version number 7.0, this is actually a new product. Uh, we saw Prime Faces uh, 6.2.23 and 7.06, and this project called uh, Joint Faces. Um, OmniFaces had the uh, release a couple of months ago, OmniFaces 3.3. So this is of course just a selection of things that have been released for uh, Faces, but it's, it's altogether not quite bad. So we see that despite the idea that um, Faces is going down, there's still quite a, lot of quite a lot of activity around it. So quite an interesting development, uh, recent development, is that uh, server-side rendering often abbreviated as um, SSR, is getting more and more attention lately. So this largely had to do because of uh, the React server-side hydration feature, which basically means that an entire page could be rendered into a string. And then if you run a React on the server-side, you could send a string to the client. So you have this full page uh, that you send. Uh, but it's not just React, it's also a few .js and a number of others uh, like that. So this is quite an interesting development um, since we do see that things um, with client-side frameworks get a little bit more complicated when things like uh, routing, uh, the data fetching, and or uh, Redux, which is the uh, dependency injection feature for client-side apps. If uh, they become part of the app, um, it all becomes just a little bit more complicated. It's not, it's not massively complicated, but it's just it makes things a bit harder. And Jakarta Faces being, of course, a native uh, server-side rendering framework uh, does, have the, does have the edge here. It's like all those things, uh, routing, the data fetching, uh, dependency injection, it's all quite, quite trivial, quite simple to do. So what really are the advantages of server-side rendering? Uh, so for one, it uh, generates uh, ready-to-render HTML which basically uh, does what it says. It's HTML that the, that the client can render right away. Um, this might be faster, since if you just send uh, data to the client and the client still has an entire uh, client-side framework to run with uh, listeners uh, being called, events being executed, uh, multiple layers of code that you have to go through, uh, it could potentially slow things down. Uh, it takes more uh, CPU power, or it could take more CPU power on the client. Um, another thing is that uh, fine-grained uh, the data fetching is server to server. So this means that if you're on the server and you need to do uh, several requests for items, say like a list of users, a, a, a price list, um, maybe the current uh, company status, what have you, then all those things are a separate API calls, separate service calls. And if you do them server to server, instead of client to server, it could be quite a bit faster in the sense that there's less uh, latency between servers than between the client and the server. 
So of course API gateways can uh, mitigate that a little, but those things are work to uh, to set up. So um, when you do this server to server uh, fetching of data, and then essentially call the data, combine them, and send them as a rendered result to the client, this could, um, in some cases, save you on bandwidth. Even though uh, the normal idea is that um, just sending uh, data to the client takes uh, less bandwidth, and this of course can be the case, but if the data that you send contains more things than the client needs, like for example you send a, a user, a data structure to the client, but you only need the name of the user, and you send the entire user structure over this, it takes more bandwidth up, obviously, and if you only use the name of the client, then this data is thrown away at the client. Um, you could of course set up services where you have some kind of graph query language where you only ask it to send the name, but those things are generally quite complicated to, uh, to code for. So it's not always done. So this server-side rendering essentially does that automatically. Um, so I already mentioned that uh, less processing on the client uh, could happen, and this in effect means that it's better for uh, battery life. So a lot of devices these days are mobile. So the more processing you do on the client, um, the more it uh, takes away from that battery life. And the the idea used to be that a client actually loves the CPU uh, to be used, and you save on uh, server CPU resources. And that's of course true, the latter. But the first one is like quite true. Like in general, users don't like their CPUs uh, being used. So if there's a side that uses a lot of CPU and a similar side that doesn't use so much CPU, um, then it might be the case that users use um, in the side that requires a less CPU on their devices. And even if they are plugged in, um, there's things like device heating up uh, laptops on your uh, lab that get quite hot when the CPU is uh, maxed out. Uh, you get all the noise associated with fans spinning up, which you don't like. So in generally, in general, you could say that people don't quite like um, websites uh, using their CPU resources. Um, besides that, there are some potential advantages in server rendering with uh, security and validation. Mm -hmm. So with uh, client frameworks, you have to be quite careful that you don't do essential security and validation on the client. Um, you can do some pre-validation, but not the actual validation that still needs to happen on the server. Um, it's easy to forget. With uh, server-side rendering, it's it's quite hard to forget this. Um, then with server-side rendering, you can still do uh, partial page requests, so you don't have to do a full page request for every uh, little data that you need. Of course, with uh, PPR on the uh, server-side framework, the client frameworks to do it do have an advantage. So um, it's not completely perfect here, but it does solve the issues for a lot of cases, especially with things like uh, WebSocket being added to uh, phases to the tree a few years ago. Um, it basically does as well as uh, client-side frameworks. Okay, so traditionally, phases has been used quite a lot with application servers although you could use it with uh, servlet containers like Tomcat and a Jetty. So let's now take a look at a new runtime, a new kind of environment to run phases in. Okay, so introducing uh, Piranha, which is a new uh, kind of runtime to run applications on. It's essentially a highly composable cloud-targeted runtime, which is quite a lot of buzzwords, but it essentially means that it's uh, small, it's uh, right-sized, so it only includes the dependencies that you need. Um, it starts up quite fast. It's um, essentially a uh, more library-targeted runtime than application server-targeted runtime, meaning that the uh, resulting jar file, the image, is immutable. You don't deploy things to it. Um, it runs from a main method that initializes the entire application. So this also means that uh, things like uh, unit testing on Piranha is quite easy. Um, the entire application that you code uh, can be set up fully programmatically as an alternative to uh, web XML in applications. Uh, Piranha at this moment has its own uh, native servlet API implementation, 
and it uses plugins for a lot of other things, uh, like plugins for um, Hara and MyFaces, plugins for Weld and um, OWB, Open Web Beans, uh, and Eddy can be plugged in, uh, Grizzly can be plugged in as well for HTTP, um, ancient services. And this runtime is uh, brought to you by the people, by the same people behind Mohara and Omnifaces. So there's quite a lot of experience uh, in building those kinds of things. So going forward, uh, Peter yeah, might actually become the uh, primary runtime that the uh, Mahara developers are going to use to develop Mahara against. And the same could hold for the uh, Jakarta authorization Eclipse implementation, which is upcoming, and the Jakarta e-security implementation, uh, Soteria. And this is basically because uh, running against, uh, developing it and running against uh, Piranha is quite, it's quite easy. So you can quite easily uh, code against it, you can quite easily configure it, uh, set it up. It's quite fast to execute uh, unit style tests against it. So this um, might give it an extra impulse going forward. Uh, so there's a lot of extended tooling support coming up. So this is basically things for Achillean uh, plug uh, plugins for the Eclipse IDE and NetBeans, what have you. So one thing to, uh, to notice is that everything is still uh, very much under construction. So um, at the moment, it's quite small still, uh, but we kind of intend to, uh, to expand on this. See how Piranha works in practice. So we have the Eclipse IDE opened here with the project already checked out. So the project is here. And we see that we have all those um, modules here, which are plugins to um, accommodate various uh, pieces of functionality in Piranha. And we have a bunch of uh, tests here. So we're going to the uh, Mara test which is here, and we're going to take a look at the uh, main unit test, which shows how a uh, phases application can be run against uh, Piranha. So if we see this method here, we see it starts with assembling an application uh, using the Piranha API. So it's, um, it's quite small here. We create a new web application, we add a resource to it, and we add a more specific initializer, which is the one here, and then we start the application, um, after which we create a request and a response, and we test it if it indeed uh, works. And the request and response are put into this service method here, which runs a request. Okay, so this uh, default directory resource, in this case, refers to uh, this directory here, where we see that the application is quite simple. It's only a single file, and it prints out, hello, Mahara. So we're now going to run this, and it's simply run as a unit test. So it's uh, run as unit test. And in the console here, we see um, Mahara being used. It's in initializing. And we can take a look at the results in the uh, unit view. So we see it run, so it's good. It passed the test, so the result is indeed as we asserted here. It took, in this case, uh, two to four seconds. It's a bit on the slow side, but this is like an extremely slow uh, laptop that I'm using to uh, do this the demo. It's, on a normal computer, it would be a second or a zero to six seconds, approximately. So this here uh, basically concludes our simple uh, demo. It shows how uh, Piranha works a little bit, how you assemble applications. And uh, we're going to add a lot of functionality to this in the future, including uh, the ability to run VARs as well, so not just the programmatic creation, but uh, the ability to run VARs, uh, more plugins, uh, more features. So stay tuned. Okay, so during the transition of JSF from Oracle to Faces and Eclipse, a number of different uh, Mahara versions have been released, and they were quite confusing, to say the least. So uh, let's take a moment to clear this up a little and look at what the version numbers are going to be going forward. So let's see. Originally, we had um, just the Mahara 2.3x rolling branch over at Oracle, and life was relatively simple. So we had the 2.3 versions there, and we released them from this branch, and things were quite easy. So then at some point, we used the, uh, the master at Oracle to start the uh, vetting for the transfer process. Which, means, uh, which meant uh, cleaning a lot of things, uh, things that weren't used anymore, but also things that were um, 
were not clear what the origin of it was, or the copyrights were not clear. So all those things were uh, deleted, or uh, the owners were found, and permission was asked for several things. So this work was done in master, and while this work was being done, there were still uh, to the three versions being released from the rolling brands. So this seemed to be uh, relatively clear still, but unfortunately things did become a bit more muddy quite fast. So um, the master uh, was called 2.4, so basically just as a mean to uh, distinguish the version being developed there. Um, in hindsight, this wasn't the best idea probably, but things happened that way. Um, so then, just before the transfer took place to mark the last um, revision from the Oracle branch, um, to that for O was accidentally released. So uh, this is a so-called uh, botched release, since a master uh, parent palm should have been released as well if this were to be a genuine release. This didn't happen. Um, the, the masters in a specific package uh, coordinates, I mean, that's uh, quite hard to release for, so this couldn't be really fixed afterwards as a result. Uh, 2.4.0 is just like this really weird version of Maven Central. Uh, we should try to have it removed at some point. So normally, Maven Central um, has this policy where you can't remove releases, but this release is like completely useless, so uh, we should maybe try to have it removed. Um, and then after the uh, transfer took place, um, another version was uh, released. So this was from the Eclipse EE for J8 branch. And we call this 3.3.102, meaning that it was uh, created from um, the Oracle, the previous Oracle master, which was 2.4.0. But 2.4.0 was actually branched off from 2.3.3 to make it a bit less. Uh, <laughs> a bit more confusing actually. So, um, 2 to 3 to 3 to 102 was actually in some way ahead of uh, 2 to 3 to 7 and in some ways uh, behind. So, this was like a really bad situation to be in. Uh, so, this was eventually solved. So, all the outstanding things that were in 2 to 3 to 7 but not in uh, 2 to 3 to 3 that 102 were merged into the EE for J8 branch. And this became 2.3.9. Uh, so this was the initial um, version that used the Jakarta Faces Maven coordinates. Um, and like I said, this was just potentially 2.3.3.102 uh, uh, brought up to date with 2.3.7, with some cleanings uh, here and there. And things were relatively uh, understandable again. So then Eclipse EE for J8, which is essentially a marker branch for the uh, Glassfish 5.1 release, which included uh, Mahara 2.3.9, uh, was branched into Eclipse uh, 2.3. So from that branch, uh, we released 2.3.10 to 2.3.12. Okay, so then uh, moving on to today, from the same Eclipse 2.3 branch, uh, we released 2.3.13. And this release is special in the sense that it's the first Jakarta EE8 certified version. Otherwise, um, it's not the different with respect to uh, namespace or coordinates. It's just the fact that this version is uh, officially Jakarta EE8 certified and it's the first one. So if we take a look at the future releases, uh, we have something we are probably going to call Eclipse. Um, the Eclipse 2.9 branch, from which we'll release uh, Mahara 2.9. And uh, the reason for this version is that there's the upcoming uh, namespace change, which means uh, the change from uh, Jafax to uh, Jakarta. Um, and the idea is that 2.9 will only consist of this namespace change and nothing else. It will be another one of those uh, special versions. So then, um, in master, we intend to uh, bring it up to date with 2.9 when that's released. And then from there on, we finally start on uh, the work we've been looking forward to for a long time. So this will be uh, Mahara 3, and this would correspond to Phases uh, Next, which will very likely be ca uh, called Phases 3.0.
Okay, so let's now move to uh, the next section of this presentation, Jakarta Faces Next. Okay, so uh, Jakarta Faces Next will be uh, resolving around a couple of different epics. And the most important epic of this release will be uh, the removal of deprecated slash temp items. And there's quite a lot of deprecated things in, uh, in Faces. So some of those things go back a really, really long time like the uh, native expression language that FACES still has. So this was uh, deprecated in 2005 with the release of FACES 1.2. Um, it's basically uh, the expression language on which the unified expression language is based. Uh, the one that got integrated with um, uh, Jakarta server pages first, and then split out to its own expression language. So this, this has been lingering within uh, FACES for a really, really long time. And I think it's now really time to, uh, to deprecate this and remove it. Um, so server pages support itself will be removed as well. So Jakarta server pages um, or JSP, as it was called back then, um, has been perhaps a bit of a mistake to have in faces. So as mentioned earlier, a lot of issues in faces 1.x can be attributed back to uh, the single decision of having Jakarta server pages support, um, having that used as the few templating language. So. It was essentially deprecated in 2009 when uh, the once external facelets was incorporated into JSF. Ever since then, um, a lot of things didn't support uh, JSP, uh, Jakarta server pages. So that's finally going to be removed. Then uh, full state saving is going to be removed as well. Uh, this is one of those things in phases that might have been a mistake from, from day one. Um, it essentially boils down to that everything in the page is being saved to the state. And a lot of those things are just statics. Uh, they're like um, attributes, static attributes on components, um, what have you. So those things don't belong really in the state. It's not state, it's just static uh, data. Uh, so it has been replaced in uh, JSF2 by partial state saving. So partial state saving only saves uh, the differences that have occurred during the processing of a page. And uh, that's of course, that's much, much less uh, data. So full state saving uh, was retained for backwards compatibility, uh, especially at the time, things like um, ice faces, uh, rich faces, they had components that depended on full state saving, but that's all a long time ago. So that's, it's finally time to let go of this. Um, and long coming is the uh, removal of the native managed bean system in uh, faces. So the, the native managed bean system is essentially um, one of the things on which CDI was based. So CDI started as a project called WebBeans that um, sought to unite the two component models, the dominant component models in Jakarta, which was um, EGB in the phases managed bean system. So that turned out to be um, quite successful. And in practice, uh, CDI beans have replaced phases uh, native managed beans for a long time. So there's like absolutely no need to, uh, to keep this around. So we're going to remove this in the phases three. And some of the weird things that we're going to remove is this so-called fake phases to the two mode. Um, it was a bit of a temp thing. Um, when phases to the three came around, there were some concerns that by switching things to CDI, like the expression language resolvers, it wouldn't be completely backwards compatible, even though it wasn't quite proven that it wasn't, uh, there were concerns raised. So um, just to be sure, phases to the three defaults to this weird phases uh, to the two mode where still the old EL resolvers are used among others. Um, and then you have to switch it over to, to the three mode of like real to the three, like everybody always hated this. So this is going to be removed as well. Um, the result of this is that um, phases 3.0 will not longer be uh, backwards compatible. So that's a major change that hasn't happened often. Um, but it's mostly the old applications would still use the old um, things that would fail to work. Um, no modern or modernist JSF apps would just work. All right, some of the other things that we're looking at is uh, continue the rebasing on, C on CDI. So CDI um, has been introduced step by step ever since um, phases to the two. It started with FlowScope, uh, which was only uh, CDI-based. Um, then into the three, a lot of things were rebased on uh, CDI, like converters and uh, the EL resolvers. 
we're going to continue this. So likely uh, CDI events are going to be introduced. Uh, they might replace the phases events. Uh, probably for um, a while they will live next to each other. So you have phases events, they will be deprecated and CCDI events will take the place. And a couple of other things related to CDI, like internal artifacts, uh, mostly factories will become CDI bins as well. Uh, kind of like it's now being done in Jakarta security. And probably a lot of other artifacts will be made injectable, although it's not sure yet at the moment uh, which one, which ones uh, this will be. Okay, so modularization is high on the list as well of epics that we want to look at for Jakarta phases next. And this basically boils down to the same kind of uh, modularization as has been done for the JDK. So uh, several features will be split out to their own modules. And this could, for instance, be uh, flows, uh, navigation rules, contracts, and maybe a few other things. And practically, this means that an application can only depend on a subset of the JSF API. So it doesn't have to include the entire API. And this might make everything a bit uh, leaner. So if you still want everything, you can just include the full module. Um, if you only want to start with the base module and then add, say, flows and navigation rules, but not contracts, you could do that as well. Um, so this would um, hopefully make things a little bit more uh, manageable, a bit more lean. So the actual features are, of course, quite important as well. So we have compiled a small list of things to be considered. So there's nothing sure yet, um, but these are the things we're looking at at this moment. So there are, for instance, um, extensionless views by default. And there might be an option to switch that off or option to switch the behavior. So we'll take a look at that in a while. Um, we might look at a new phase or a life cycle for MVC uh, push, which has quite often been requested. Um, so it's a bit controversial, of course, since MVC uh, pull versus MVC push. It's a bit like a programming language with functional versus object oriented. Um, people have strong ideas about that, um, but we're going to take a look at this in a bit. Uh, the other thing that we often get complaints about is the um, the API for sending a faces message. At the moment this is quite um, quite complex in JSF to do. It was like one of the original complaints against JSF. Um, it still hasn't been like fully resolved. Um, Normally faces does uh, bring a solution to this, makes it a lot easier to add faces messages. Um, so something like this would be brought into uh, the core of faces. Uh, the other thing we want to look at um, that has been done a couple of times in prototypes but never included in phases proper is first class support for creating views in Java. So currently uh, most code, most applications would use uh, facelets to do this. Um, but actually there's a pretty usable uh, Java API to do the same thing. So advanced users um, take um, uh, use this for creating dynamic uh, components so they can uh, then dynamically uh, manipulate the view using the uh, the Java syntax to uh, create components to add components but you could just as well create the entire view this way um, so the API has basically been there since uh, day one in phases but there's never like a real easy way to create the entire views this way so we intend to add something for that and about one of the other things small thing is uh, stateless views as a global option so currently, um, you can set the state saving mechanism, like save state on client or save state on server globally. But stateless views have to be set per, uh, per view. So we want to change that and make this a global option just as well. OK, so what's the current uh, progress for both implementations, Mahara and MyFaces? Uh, Mahara started with removing some of the uh, deprecated items in the master branch. Although um, we did have to do a lot of work for the EE4J brands for the um, uh, recent uh, Jakarta release. So this has all been done in other branches, meaning that uh, we're again facing this situation where like one branch is ahead in one way and the other branch is ahead in another way. So we probably have to consolidate that a little bit and then continue work in master, um, especially the package change that's upcoming. Uh, it's quite, uh, has quite an impact on the work we do there. So we also see that uh, MyFaces has started um, with removing the JSF expression language and the admin has been system 
and they did a big cleanup as well. So, for instance, they merged uh, shared and shared public modules into my faces implement. And this was done because there were no other dependencies on those, so they could just as well include them there. And it has gotten quite a bit faster. So um, my face is already quite fast. Um, and they got it about 50% faster still. And the jars are a bit smaller as well. So this is, this is looking quite good. Okay, so let's take a, a look at an example of what removing the uh, native expression language entails. So what you see here is uh, the action source interface, which is quite well known in uh, faces. And they have all these uh, methods that are related to the old expression language. And that's method binding and value binding, uh, mostly. So the, the problem with these uh, methods is that it, it takes time to mentally uh, digest and to notice it's uh, deprecated. So if you have all these uh, methods, all around the interfaces, it just makes it somewhat harder uh, to see the actual methods that uh, that are to be used. So they don't really hurt the system to be there, but they just uh, contribute to the mental overload of developers. Um, so methods like you see here are going to be uh, removed. So for a second example, let's take a look at the um, extensionless URLs by default feature. So first, uh, extensionless URLs are uh, URLs without any needless uh, markers, and these uh, markers are used for mapping to um, to tell the system essentially which servlet is going to be invoked uh, to handle a request. So these would be things like uh, that HTML or slash faces in the beginning of the path. Um, although of course slash faces in the beginning of the path would technically not be an extension, but it's a general term being used here. Uh, so an example of this would be the two URLs. Um, the first one doesn't have the dot XHTML, or the second uh, has, and typically this, this just clutters the URL a little. So in phases uh, two to three, uh, we introduced quite some groundwork to make extensionless URLs possible. Um, essentially, we added um, my methods to obtain all the views that are available within the system. So this is a VDL templating language specific. Um, we can't really know where a VDL stores its views in a general way. So you have to ask the uh, VDL implementation. In the default case, this would be facelets, where all the URLs, uh, sorry, where all the views are stored and uh, to which few names they correspond. So we did this groundwork, but then we basically ran out of time and we didn't, ex we didn't include it as a higher level feature. Uh, so there's the ability to uh, grab the, uh, the views, to uh, map them, but there's not a single switch to turn this on. Um, so at the moment, uh, user application would require quite a bit of elaborate code to do this. We're going to look, take a look at that uh, next. So here you see the code that's uh, needed to uh, to make views extensionless in faces. So it's it's not super difficult, but it's just tedious and elaborate. Um, essentially. Um, you get the faces servlet, uh, you get all the views in the applications, and you add a mapping for each view to this servlet. And that's essentially it. I said not very difficult, but still uh, quite tedious to do. Okay, so we're actually looking at two options to do this. Um, option one is extensionless by default, and option two would be extensionless as an option. So with option one uh, by default, that, that might be the cleanest way. But then again, um, if you want to preserve some kind of backwards compatibility, um, this might not be the best option. So everybody running an existing application might want to switch this off uh, for all the applications, which, which might not be that nice. Uh, but they could do so. That would be a simple uh, faces config annotation with extensionless is false. And set option two would be the exact opposite. So it would have the same option, um, only if you would want extensionless, you would set it to true. So besides the simple on-off option, we're looking at some other um, attributes for this. So this could, for instance, be uh, what to do when the original page is being requested. Um, so this, if you won't do anything, you would get the source of the page, which would not, of course, be what you want. Uh, so we could look at essentially two options. Uh, one of them would be to uh, send a uh, 404 and not found when the original page is requested. Uh, so this would be the one with the extension. Um, the other one would be a redirect to the uh, extensionless version, 
and maybe just another option would be to just uh, render the page. So I have both uh, foo in this example and foo that XHTML HTML uh, represent the same content. So we're not really sure uh, which one we're going to add or which one to default to, which would be the most important decision to make. Uh, so we're still looking at this. Okay, so for the third example, we're going to look at the MVC push proposal. So um, phase has started as MVC pool, which is also called uh, component-based MVC. And what MVC pool does is it logically starts processing at the view, and then the view pulls in data from multiple uh, places, multiple controllers, if you want. Um, so in JSF, in phases, this is uh, technically um, not even the case, since it starts uh, processing at the faceless servlet, which is the controller and then the controller uh, calls the view. But logically, um, how people feel this works is that uh, the view starts processing. Um, so even though a few can pull in data from multiple uh, places, it's just an expression language um, reference that's being used and it can essentially pull in uh, with it whatever it wants. Best practices have for a long time uh, said that only one controller should be used uh, per few. So that would be the backing bean. And the general rule is to have uh, one backing bean per few. So it could still reference some helper uh, bean, some helper controllers. But essentially, the main advice is, has always been uh, one controller, uh, one backing bean per few. So in um, phases two, uh, released in 2009, uh, we did already add a couple of things for MVC push. So this is also called the action-oriented paradigm. Um, and these were essentially the view param and the view action. So specifically, the view action is quite action-oriented. It's in the name too, <laughs> view action. Uh, so what this view action does, it executes an action at the start of a page. So you still logically have the page first, but the action is essentially executed when the page is uh, requested, when the page is loaded. And this has this action-oriented feel to it. So in practice, uh, phases already functions as a kind of a hybrid MVC push-pull framework. Uh, though of course, it's leaning more uh, towards pull. OK, so these uh, few actions in uh, JSF in phases, they uh, can sometimes be a bit hacky, or they feel a bit hacky. So for instance, if there's always a redirect to a different view needed, um, the view, the page, the template that uh, triggers uh, the view action is actually kind of unnecessary. It's just an empty placeholder and a URL mapping, if you want. Um, so that, that feels a bit, a bit heavyweight in that sense. Um, so the proposal is to introduce an action lifecycle in phases. And that means that um, essentially the entire uh, current lifecycle where uh, the face surface is invoked, it uh, loads a page, it tries to see if there's anything that needs to be restored, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's not going to be invoked. So the action lifecycle would only call a uh, bean, a CDI bean, which would then act as the controller. Um, then the controller could uh, redirect or perform some action, what have you. So it's important to realize uh, this is not going to uh, compete with Jakarta MVC, which is the other framework we have in Jakarta. Uh, Jakarta MVC is basically a pure action-based framework, kind of like Spring MVC, where you have Jux based controllers and the entire uh, lifecycle thing that JSF has, the entire component thing, uh, does not exist. So it's, it's a bit like uh, programming languages, again, where you have uh, pure functional languages like Haskell, Lisp, and you have pure object-oriented languages. And then you have languages that are like a bit in between, like uh, Scala, uh, Kotlin, uh, recently uh, Java, but they do lean more towards a certain spectrum. Uh, so obviously Java has some functional aspects to it, but it's only some. It still heavily leads, uh, leans toward the um, object-oriented model. So this would be the same with, uh, with faces. So it would have some action things like it already has, um, but it's not going to be an action-oriented framework. It remains a um, MVC pool framework. So this new action lifecycle is intended for cases where current uh, phases applications would now just use a servlet. So 
a servlet uh, works, of course. It uh, can process a request, do some processing, redirect, so that's essentially fine. Um, but the thing is that the servlet doesn't have the uh, faces context available. So it runs, but it doesn't run within the faces context. So um, some things can't be used there, some scopes aren't active. So that's all a bit problematic. Um, and it's essentially the action the lifecycle, the new uh, the, the new bean type that would introduce would replace the cases we would otherwise uh, use a servlet in the faces application. Okay, so let's take a look at some code. Let's see how this actually looks um, in practice. So what we see here is uh, the action bean, and it's basically made into an action bean by having this action mapping annotation on the method, and this would uh, reference a, a URL. So this uh, this bean is fully executed within the faces context, uh, but the bean is executed first upon receiving a request for it. Uh, there's no fake empty page uh, loaded. Uh, there's not a action uh, triggered behind the scenes. It's just the uh, servlet that is behind this with invoke this bean uh, right away. Um, so this has the advantages of uh, being quite simple. So this can be implemented with just a few lines of code essentially in the implementation. Uh, we have a, a prototype uh, available for this, which is on the uh, URL shown below. And it's clear it's not that much code. It's essentially a custom uh, lifecycle, custom servlet. And it looks up a bean and executes it. It's not much uh, more than that. And then, so even though it's it's quite simple, uh, this might really, uh, really help JSF. OK, so these were uh, most of the examples that we were looking at. So we're coming to the end of this presentation. Uh, so as usual, uh, you can help. Uh, help is a lot appreciated. And a lot of people do help at the moment. So that's a uh, big thank. Big thank you to all our contributors out there. Um, the uh, URLs are listed here. And if you want to contact us, there's the uh, mailing list as well. So once again, uh, thank you. And with that, we're coming to the end of the presentation. Thank you.